So, um, I'm Elora Finlay. I chair the uh, Carbon Monoxide Research Trust. And some of you may also know me as a co-chair of <coughs> the All-Party Parliamentary Carbon Monoxide Group, which has been going for some years. I'd like to start off by welcoming our colleagues and friends from the USA. So I think they are the only people who've travelled by air to come here today. Um, but Sharon, would you like to just stand up and mark just so everyone knows who you are? But it's great to have you here with us. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'd also like to start off by just explaining to you uh, what court is. We used to be the Gas Safety Trust, but uh, everyone, of course, is very aware that carbon monoxide comes off lots of things other than gas stoves and boilers, and that actually the biggest threat is low-level CO exposure. And so we have gone, thankfully, much wider and looked at CO as a topic. Can I just ask all of you who have themselves had low-level CO poisoning at some point to put your hands in the air? Oh, there's not that many of us in the room, but there we are. Isn't it great to still be alive? Um, so, but I would uh, like to just remind you that, of course, the all, the all party parliamentary group produced a report on low level CO poisoning uh, because many of you here have been worried about that over the years. And it's become ever more evident that low level carbon monoxide poisoning is actually very toxic. And there are long term sequelae from it. And it's a danger that people had ignored. And of course, you can't smell it, you can't see it etc. So we, we are all aware. Sometimes, of course, it hits the headlines, like Mo Salah in the aeroplane, but how many other people sitting in different enclosed environments, whether aeroplanes, cars, or wherever, have actually had low-level CO poisoning and been unaware of it. And now that housing is moving to be more hermetically sealed, um, of course, if you've got a source of carbon monoxide in the house, it just gets more and more concentrated. Because the wonderful days of drafty old houses where we all put on an extra pullover that was very scratchy and itchy and horrible, but we put it on uh, to stay warm, uh, are over and people walk around in t-shirts and expect things of course, to be warm in the environment, but we've got rid of those drafts, which may have been lifesavers in the past. Um, and in different environments too, we have schools adjacent to very large railway um, motorways. Uh, some schools are even built underneath uh, motorway flyovers. And uh, we don't, just don't know what's happening there because these kids are there every day, but the levels aren't monitored, and the levels of air toxicity altogether aren't monitored. We have a private member's bill on uh, air quality on Friday that I'm going to be speaking in, and I'm going to focus on carbon monoxide in that. I think most other people will focus on particulates, um, but I'm going to focus on, on CO. So there's a bit of a commitment from me to you all. So what does court do? Court is here as a research trust because we are very well aware that we need very high quality data. We've had years of anecdotes of tragedies. We've had years of people with different theories about how to manage and what would be the solution, but they haven't been necessarily properly trialled out scientifically. They haven't necessarily been properly costed out either. Um, and we really need to be able to recommend to government things which will be cost effective uh, with a stress on the effective, but in the days of the current financial climate, they also have to be cost effective too. And so research evidence is ever more important. The CO Medical Group uh, have done a great deal of work already in getting together 
Um, and I would like to pull one person out. Izzy, can you stand up for everybody? Because uh, Izzy and I had conversations many years ago now, and uh, we just got rolling over the medical stuff, and I should declare that I'm a medic as well. So there's a, possibly a little bit of concern there about the medical effects of carbon monoxide. But we want this meeting to be a time when you share ideas, all positive conversations, no looking backwards now, just learning from the past, looking forwards really positively so that we can develop our research priorities. And we hope that out of today, some really fantastic ideas for areas that need high quality research will emerge and move forwards and of course bring them to us as a trust because that's what we're there for to fund and uh, promote collaborative innovative thinking to develop the really the future data to bring about changes nobody should think that as we go away from from gas that the problem is going to be solved more and more people are going to have wood burning stoves live in insulated, sealed environments and so on. And of course, engines and things are going to be there for many, many decades to come. The days of the solar powered aeroplane, I think are a long way off, to be honest. But there we are. Now, after today, um, and in a moment, Adrian's going to talk to you about how to apply, apply for research grants and how it works and how it's funded. After today, there's a drinks reception. So when you've had your nice relaxing drink at the drinks reception, please remember you're not switching off. That is your beginning of your thinking time because everyone who's coming to the Sandpit event tomorrow, we want you to have really absorbed from today, reflected on today, and come forward with ideas for innovation and moving forwards. And uh, Broad, broad thoughts, please. We don't want you pursuing your one line and, and going on about it too much because it may be that other people can help you modify your ideas. So this is all about thinking outside the box in many ways, thinking innovatively. Um, and I just hope that everybody enjoys it, feels inspired, and um, it's fantastic to see many, so many people having come. And I'm really glad that we haven't had a high dropout rate because of COVID. It's great. But perhaps we'll just keep a little bit of social distancing and be COVID aware, just in case. But thank you all very much. And I'm delighted to hand over to Adrian. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's really, really nice to see so many of you here today and, um, yeah, that you made the effort to come down. Uh, and it's quite nice to see people unframed by rectangles, so that's a bonus as well. Um, yeah, it's brilliant to see so many old faces and friends who have turned out after two years, and some of you that I've only met virtually. Um, and a few people have said to me that actually I'm not as tall in real life, so, you know, <laughs> a bit like Stonehenge. But anyway... Um, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I've been asked to say that we're not expecting a fire alarm today. So if a fire alarm goes off, there'll be a siren and there'll be a message and then we will file out into Dean's yard and congregate there and we'll check against the um, attendee list. But that's not going to happen, hopefully. Um, and the, the Wi-Fi um, code, the Wi-Fi is the CWH uh, Wi-Fi and the password is Westminster One with a capital W. Um, so today, we've got four sessions um, of presentations, improving diagnosis, uh, treatments and therapeutics, understanding comorbidities and CO exposure, and then the final session is protecting at-risk groups from exposure. Um, in between there, we have a coffee break at 11.40, lunch at th uh, 1.20, and then a comfort break at 3.30. Three, uh, 3 uh, before we go into the reception, probably around half five because we're expecting to overrun. Um, you can download the agenda here on our website and then, um, so I'm just going to move on to my presentation. Okay, 
So, so this is our first conference following the adoption of our new strategy. We wanted to show some of the work that we've been funding, but also look forward to how we focus our efforts in the future. Our aim is to be more inclusive, more collaborative, and help facilitate those conversations that develop new ideas and innovative research. Over the years, we've kind of attempted this in a bit of a piecemeal way. We've nibbled around the edges. Um, we've lots and lots of great work in a number of key areas. And really, this event is an opportunity to take stock, look at how we might encourage work, which will have impactful outcomes and make a real difference in the future. And today and, today and tomorrow, really, are about us listening to you guys, who are the experts, and with your advice and guidance, helping to develop new proposals and new projects. So these are our current areas of interest. We um, agreed a new strategy about 18 months ago, and we have um, seven areas that we're focusing on. The first being the um, uh, improving the diagnosis of CO poisoning by finding a new biomarker, looking at the mechanics of CO poisoning to help improve treatments, to understand the comorbidities in vulnerable groups to develop solutions to mitigate risk, to measure the scale of CO poisoning in the UK, and to understand the impact of building regulations and energy efficiency on CO safety. Um, we also want to look at how we can improve detection and risk of CO exposure where the risk can't be eliminated. And we have an event coming up in the autumn which we hope to do with COGDEM, which will start to address some of those issues. And then finally, which Baroness Finlay mentioned in her uh, remarks, we want to understand the level of risk in the use of solid fuel. Um, so today and this year, our application process is focusing on the first three areas of diagnosis. Um, the first being a new biomarker, which is an area we're already funding research in, but this is a critical area of research. We know that there are limitations with carboxyhemoglobin, and it's essential that we find a new biomarker to make diagnosis easier, to ensure that the people who need treatment receive it, and to make sure that all cases of CO exposure are identified so we finally get a true picture of the level of risk and the level of incidence. The second area that we're interested in is better treatments and therapeutics. And this is to improve the treatments and therapeutics for CO exposure. We need to better understand the mechanisms of CO poisoning to review and build upon current methods and to further explore the increased susceptibility and, and specific risks associated with vulnerable groups and those with underlying health conditions, which naturally brings us on to the third area, which formed the third and fourth um, sessions of our presentations today, which is understanding vulnerable groups and comorbidities. Whilst it's generally thought that the elderly, children, pregnant women, and people living in fuel poverty, and people with underlying health conditions are more susceptible to CO exposure, we need to develop policies and solutions that mitigate those risks, we need to increase our knowledge of why those groups are more vulnerable, and we need to understand what the level of risk is. So what's the process for us this year? So we're launching our, um, our grant call for the year today. At the same time, we're opening our expressions of interest stage. Uh, we've revised our process on last year. Um, some of the feedback we had from previous applicants was that we were asking for a hell of a lot of information and a lot of the, you know, we get so many applications that they weren't being taken forward. So we've introduced an expression of interest uh, stage so that people can put in their ideas and our board of trustees can look at those and then we can shortlist and take forward the ones that fit our um, strategy and also the ones that are likely to be funded. Um, so our expressions of interest um, call will close at the end of September and those shortlisted application, applicants will be asked to fill a full form and we'll go through our normal process announcing our grant awards in March. Um, I'm going to be around all day, so if anybody wants to come and talk to me, I'd you know, come over and have a chat. Um, I'm quite conscious that I want to go through this quickly because we've got a lot to get through today and I don't want to sort of eat into anyone else's time. Um, but before I hand over to Sharon's one final thought, um, before I do hand over, I just want to stop and remind us all about the work that we do. You know, we often get lost in the weeds when we talk about carbon monoxide from a research perspective. We focus on the esoteric areas that can really seem removed from what our ultimate goal is. So before we disappear down those research rabbit holes, I want to sort of stand back and widen the lens a little bit 
and remind us that ultimately the goal here is keeping people safe, reducing harm and improving health and well-being. At the end of the day, everything we do is a per, you know, everything we're, at the end of the day, everything we're doing, there is a person. We mustn't lose sight of that. Um, and when I was writing this the other day, I was trying to think how to, in, in, um, to illustrate this on a slide. Um, and I kept coming back to um, a, a 70s TV show, Quincy ME, which, I don't know, probably half the people in the room won't recognise, but his sort of catchphrase was always talking about human life. And it just kept coming back to my head, so I thought, you know, in, in the absence of anything else that was suitable, I'd include him. But ultimately, you know, that's why we're here today, is to try and protect people and keep them well. So I hope you'll forgive me that. Anyway, enough from me. Um, I'd like to hand over now to Sharon, who's going to come up and talk about the work that she does. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. It's an honor and pleasure. Um, in the States, uh, we don't have a group that's focused on carbon monoxide research. So this is uh, really very interesting for us. And we take your research and we try and move it into action and change. So that is what I'd like to talk about today. Introduce our organization, what we do, as well as how we move the research into substantive change. Our vision is pretty simple and carbon monoxide poisoning, both acute and chronic. And we're doing that by driving a comprehensive conversation around the public health crisis of carbon monoxide poisoning. So everyone in this room knows about both acute and chronic, but in the US, it's not as well known. Um, I won't spend any time on this, um, but I'll get to my story. Um, I'm an electrical engineer in the automotive industry. I bought what I thought was my dream home. I did everything that I knew was to be right. I had the home inspected before I purchased it. I had the appliances inspected by professional HVAC engineers. I had a carbon monoxide alarm, and I went to the best doctors. After 11 years, I was walking with a cane and on oxygen 24-7, diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. It was due to several leaks from my appliances that were not caught by any of the inspectors nor was it caught by any of my doctors. So taking my background as a research engineer, we tried to understand how it's possible to do everything right and still have tragic carbon monoxide poisoning. And we found that there are six gaps in the CO safety net. First and foremost, overall lack of equipment. Secondly, lack of training and awareness. Our home CR alarms worn way too late. There's lack of robust data and robust diagnostics, and we lack support for our carbon monoxide survivors. So I'm gonna deep dive into each of those gaps. First and foremost, equipment. In the States, only 14% of homes have properly functioning carbon monoxide alarms. To make matters worse, the rate of installation between carbon monoxide alarms and fire alarms is disproportionate. In Michigan last year, we installed over 14,000 smoke alarms, but yet, yet less than 900 CO alarms. That's just residential. But think about all the other industries that have uh, carbon-based appliances, burning appliances, uh, aviation, um, boating, um, RV, hotels, motels, restaurants, automotive, all of these industries have carbon monoxide producing equipment in center stage of that industry, yet none of them have widespread carbon monoxide alarms. Why? You can smell, taste, touch fire, hear fire. Carbon monoxide indistinguishable for humans, yet we have 90% penetration rate in the states for fire alarms, 14% smoke alarms. Doesn't make any sense. 
The second gap in the CO safety net is training and education. Um, and this applies to all first responders, not only firefighters, but police officers, EMTs, emergency room doctors, and of course, HVAC professionals. We can do better. So we're partnering with the National Fire Protection Agency and the National Fallen Firefighter Foundation to develop carbon monoxide training for our first responders. The third gap in uh, the USCO safety net is that our alarms warn too late. Now, I understand that the um, carbon monoxide standard for alarms is different in the UK than in the US, but in the US, all alarms are designed to UL 2034. And that standard requires that the CO alarm does not warn below 70 parts per million. It is considered a life safety device, not an injury prevention. Now, if you look at the World Health Organization health guidelines, it's four parts per million, way over 10 times what uh, the health or World Health Organization were, um, defines as a injury prevention device. Um, as Adrian mentioned earlier, data uh, in the US we don't have robust uh, data systems. The CDC says only 400 people per year are, um, die from CO poisoning. The fact of the matter is we just don't know what that number is. That 400 number that the CDC uses is an estimate based on decades old surveillance data that was not designed for CO poisoning. So the fact is we just don't know. The National Fire Incident Reporting System, or NFERS, is what our firefighters use to track carbon monoxide, but this is a voluntary system and used only by 75% of fire departments, and it lacks details such as um, last two months, University of Wisconsin, Madison, and, uh, and um, Milwaukee both had carbon monoxide leaks within their dorms and the university. Hundreds of students were affected, yet when the firefighters report this, they report one incident, not the hundreds of students that were affected. We need better data. Diagnostics is something that um, near to dear to my heart. I went to, I spent thousands and thousands of dollars on doctor visits, yet um, if there was a simple diagnostic test that they could do, um, we, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. Um, this, and the reason, and I'm sure everyone in this room knows it, but I'll just go through it real quick, is that doctors diagnose based on two steps. First, symptoms, that's problematic because carbon monoxide mix, mimics um, base, basically all common illnesses that we know. And the second step is testing, so for our half-life, if a doctor even suspects carbon monoxide. We need to do better. Treatment um, is the sixth gap. So what is that? Car oxygen therapy is typically the gold standard for uh, carbon monoxide treatment, but it does very little for brain damage, cardiac tissue damage, nerve tissue damage. So we need to find better di diagnostics and treatment for carbon monoxide poisoning. So as a very small nonprofit in the US, um, how do we overcome multiple hurdles spanning multiple industries? What we decided is that we need to bring together the subject matter experts within those industries to affect change. And we're doing that by creating the National Carbon Monoxide Safety Coalition. And what this looks like is um, in the yellow, you'll steer, see our steering committee. International Code Council and the National Fire Protection Agency are the two agencies within, within the U.S. that define codes throughout the country. The second, um, sorry, the third uh, steering committee position we're leading, leaving open for the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And then the fifth is the National Fire Association of State Fire Marshals. We've had two steering committees thus far and we're putting together webinars and a conference next year. We, we hope you will come and spread your knowledge within this uh, coalition. 
the light blue are the working groups. So we've tried to align the working groups with the gaps in the CO safety net. So first education and then data, then diagnostics and treatment, then codes, regulations, and standards, and recreation is everything outside of the home or a building. So thank you very much. Um, these are our partners. Um, we have a number of, uh, of great partners in the U.S. NASCAR reached out to us and asked us to put their CO safety strategy together, which they rolled out at Daytona last year. Um, and in order to make all of this work, we created, with the help of University of Michigan and Michigan State University, a 10-year uh, CO safety strategy. And it's a two-part strategy. First is outreach and restoration, and then research and reform. And what this looks like is community outreach needs to have very strong community education, not what we have been doing very detailed information such as there was a study done earlier this year that that said 86 percent of homeowners believe that their alarms will warn them at the presence of CO but we know that's not true we believe that all residents should have the ability to understand how the alarms work so that they can make decisions to protect themselves and their family. The second step is equipment and training. We need to make sure all first responders have the right equipment and the right training. In Michigan, we believe we're going to receive a million dollar grant next year to equip every fire department with a CO monitor, training, and then also a breath monitor for diagnostics. So that breath monitor will help them die the EMTs diagnose residents, but also the firefighters themselves after they're exposed in a fire. The third step is all buildings should have carbon monoxide alarms. The fourth step is victim support. So we believe carbon monoxide poisoning is different than other injuries. If I break my arm, I can still make intelligent decisions about my health and welfare. But carbon monoxide causes long-term neurological damage. Very difficult to just say, oh, well, go fix your HVAC appliance or your boiler. It doesn't work that way. So we need to support our victims better. The second half of our 10-year strategy is research and reform. And what that means is we need to understand the prevalence. We know it's not 400 deaths per year, but what is the right number? I suspect it's in the millions. And people who are di misdiagnosed, like I was with early onset Alzheimer's, or heart disease, or COPD, or, or depression, could very easily be misdiagnosed as carbon monoxide poisoning. So we need to um, assess the prevalence by um, doing a prevalence study, and then also creating a co more comprehensive carbon monoxide database. The second step is medical education and training. The research that you're doing translated into actual practice at the physicians. And then the third step is carbon monoxide standards and regulation. What that means is every fuel burning appliance should have a carbon monoxide shutoff. We in the States were very successful to get a generator uh, shutoffs uh, when, um, carbon, when generators are placed in the wrong position, say a basement or a garage, there's a CO sensor on a generator, it shuts off the fuel to the generator, so it stops producing carbon monoxide. So we believe that every fuel, carbon, carbon fuel burning appliance should have a CO shutoff. And, you know, I mentioned I'm an automotive engineer. Well, in automotive, we would never think about designing or manufacturing a vehicle without brakes. Matter of fact, we have redundancy built into the injury prevention. Not only do we have brakes, but we have anti-lock brakes. We have emergency brakes. We have airbags. We have side airbag curtains. We have seat belts. We have all sorts of redundancies within the vehicle to prevent injury, but not one on a carbon monoxide producing appliance. Doesn't make any sense and we can do better. So I just ask that 
um, as we move forward, let's turn this wonderful research that you all are doing into action, into substantive change. Um, if you go to our website, ncoaa.us, you'll see right on the landing page a yellow button. And that yellow button uh, allows you to sign up to be part of the coalition to receive our updates. Um, and I encourage you all to help us join the fight. And we're, again, thank you so much for being here um, and inviting us. Thank you, Sharon, for that. Um, Shirley, could I ask you and your, your group to come up to the stage, please? Um, I've just been asked to repeat the Wi-Fi code. Um, so the, the Wi-Fi is the uh, CWH guest, and then the password is Westminster with a capital W followed by one. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to introduce and invite my three speakers up, otherwise I'll have no speakers for this session. <laughs> Excellent. So welcome, and as Adrian said, it's lovely to see so many of my trustee friends here who I've only seen as squares. Even my interview was for the board was via Zoom, I believe, Adrian, um, and everyone was a square. I, I've recently been at the British Toxicology um, Society meeting, and again, um, I didn't recognize half the people there because I've only seen them on either Zoom or Teams. So it's wonderful to be here today and see you all in person. Uh, and I'd like to thank Colt for um, inviting me to chair this session and being able to introduce my three colleagues um, who I've worked and am working with. So um, it's uh, a pleasure and I'm sure that you're going to find their presentations very inspiring and we will take some questions. Hopefully we can have a couple of questions at the end of each of the speakers' presentations, but there will be some time at the very end for a Q&A session. So my background, I'm a toxicologist. I'm from the University of Surrey, professor of toxicology. And um, for my sins, I was the president of the British Tox Society and now the immediate past president and a trustee of court. My first speaker I've worked with, uh, together with a number of people in this room, Heather, um, and we've recently been funded by Court for some work um, on an EDCO study. But I'm not going to steal Heather's thunder, and I'm just going to introduce her. So Heather is a research director, nursing, midwifery, and allied health professions, and clinical research lead for the emergency department at St George's University Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust in London. Heather co-chairs the National Institute for the Health Research, Emergency Care Incubator, and holds a visiting chair in the joint faculty of Kingston University and St. George's. Her research interests are diverse, but include low-level carbon monoxide exposure, and of course, very apt for today's uh, discussions, and the impact of fr uh, frailty on major trauma patients. Uh, Heather holds a number of grants as Chief Investigator and is an experienced Principal Investigator on clinical trials. I'd like to welcome Heather and invite her up to give her first presentation. Thank you, Heather. Hopefully I've got some slides. Yep, there we go. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, to speak, just a sort of couple of words um, from me. The first one is uh, my professional background is that, is that I'm a nurse. Uh, I'm still a nurse. I've been an emergency nurse for about 25 years. And I think the other thing that I would say of my emergency nursing background is that I'm very much an accidental carbon monoxide researcher. Um, and I was um, lucky enough, I think is probably the right phrase, to uh, be invited to join a study um, that was sort of preconceived by some experts in the room to, to look at whether or not um, we could improve and support and try and find out what the prevalence of low level carbon monoxide exposure was in emergency department patients. Um, and then I, when I joined that group, 
really from a research delivery emergency nursing expertise, that was my um, contribution originally to the group, um, I then took over as chief investigator. So lots of people to thank, um, some are in the room and I'll show you who the others are. Um, so I, I think the sort of, I'm, I'm on the slot if you like around improving diagnosis and I think you already heard at least twice this morning around some of the challenges we have as um, clinicians in particular in, in how we might uh, think about diagnosing carbon monoxide exposure. Um, so I'm going to talk you through a couple of things really from, from the perspective of a live NHS clinician, um, but also then share with you some of the results of the, uh, of the EDCO study. So whilst I'm, in the, in the, whilst I'm going to talk about sort of improving diagnosis, I'm going to really talk about going back one step to the challenges um, that actually Sharon really uh, beautifully picked up on in, is around really how do we as clinicians even think about diagnosis of carbon monoxide exposure in the first place because if we don't think about it we don't test for it so really bridging the gap between um, how we get clinicians to think about diagnosing carbon monoxide in order to test for it and, and there's some great other um, speakers on the podium to talk about some of those challenges too. So as I said I'm, I'm giving a personal perspective really about diagnosing um, carbon monoxide exposure and again low level carbon monoxide exposure in the emergency department um, you know, but you could equally apply this, I think, to general practice, to first responders, to NHS 111 services, um, and other what we would call first contact practitioners. And again, I'm just going to, to reiterate what's going to be said, I'm sure, very many times in terms of diagnosing CO exposure. So the first thing from a clinician perspective, or the first thing anyone really needs to think about is, you know, what are the symptoms of, of CO exposure? And we know, don't we, the very common ones are around headache or chest pain or flu-like symptoms. We've talked already about the elevated carbon monoxide or um, carboxyhemoglobin levels that we measure. So as a clinician, having some symptoms of exposure and then having an elevated COHB would raise our suspicion. And the third element really to confirm um, diagnosis is that we need to really think about how we confirm a source of CO exposure. So again, as clinicians, we're very used to triangulating lots of different bits of information to form a diagnosis. But again, as clinicians, what we don't know um, is this, you know, has the patient that's in front of us got a confirmed source of exposure? So some of our challenges um, in the emergency department are patients are really unaware that they've been exposed. Um, so again, we know the, the sort of obvious conditions that might present CO, in low, um, CO exposure. In low level exposure, it's much harder. The symptoms of CO exposure in an emergency department setting are usually not CO exposure. And I'll give you some figures um, around sort of the types of patients that we see. And we know that the diagnostic test results that are currently available to us are really difficult to interpret within a clinical setting. So I'm just going to um, share a really short video from, um, I can see he's in the room, he's looking at his feet already, um, from one of our emergency medicine clinicians um, who's probably about as old as I am, so he's been around in practice for a long time. Um, and just to talk about his perspective around, as an emergency medicine consultant, what is it about CO diagnosis? Um, and I'm um, my camera skills are back in, behind the camera skills are about as bad as his in front of the camera skills. So I apologise in advance for my editing, but we'll give it, give it a go. Hello, I'm Dr Phil Moss. I'm one of the ED consultants here in the emergency department at St George's Hospital in South West London. We took part and recruited patients to the EDCO study. I'm going to give you a personal and professional perspective on the diagnosis of patients with carbon monoxide exposure. During my 25 year career in emergency medicine, I've diagnosed very few patients with carbon monoxide exposure. The patients I did diagnose presented with very obvious causes. For instance, they'd been involved in a house fire. Um, this makes the diagnosis, or at least the thought to diagnose carbon monoxide exposure fairly straightforward and easy. We do, however, see lots of patients who present with headache, with chest pain, with flu-like symptoms, all of which we now know could be related to carbon monoxide. However, personally in my career, um, this very rarely occurred to me as a potential diagnosis. Interpreting the carboxyhemoglobin level on the venous gas is problematic. This is because we know that the levels will drop 
um, from time of exposure to time of presentation to the emergency department. Therefore, we go back to the point that it's really incumbent on myself as a clinician to actually think about carbon monoxide exposure on a more regular basis, especially for patients who present with common problems such as headache, chest pain or flu-like symptoms. Ideally, of course, a better biomarker than carboxyhemoglobin would be most welcome to aid the diagnostic process. If you want to see the top of his head, it's behind you. The, um, okay, so Phil alluded to this. So again, lots of people in the room will be really aware of the, the common signs of CO exposure, headache, nausea, chest pain, dizziness, patients with, um, who've collapsed with difficulty in breathing. As an ED clinician, we see hundreds and thousands of these patients every year. And actually for us trying to determine which ones might have low level CO exposure is really tricky. So just to give you an idea, um, the UK sees about 25 million emergency department patients per year. Um, this is a fairly recent um, published paper that talked about hospital admissions for unintentional exposure, um, where there are about 230. So this is admissions in the patients that we know have exposure, and I take on board all of the stuff we know about. We don't diagnose patients in the first place. So that, if you look at that in terms of what an, an average emergency medicine consultant or emergency medicine clinician might see, that's the, that's the number of ED attendances as a percentage with unintentional CO exposure. So for us, it's this issue about the kind of, it's more likely to be something else. So how do we, as clinicians with an interest in low-level CO exposure, make sure that other clinicians even consider it? So just a quick word about um, diagnosis. So... Lots, again, lots of will be familiar. The majority of patients that we see in the emergency department setting will ha who have blood investigations will have a venous gas measured, which would include a carboxyhemoglobin level routinely. We don't do it because we think they've got CO exposure. We do it because it happens to be on the assay that we run. And there are other methods. Um, I'm, I'm delighted that from a research perspective, we've got a research fellow also in the room um, and we have a review of, uh, we did a scoping review fairly recently because what we noticed as clinicians when we started exploring this area is that no one presents the same values for the cutoff. So clinicians are presented in the UK with two different clinical guidelines with two different abnormal cutoffs. So as clinicians, even when we refer to the guidance, it's really hard to say, is this a normal COHB level for this patient or not? So this is just an example of some. Um, both research and clinical guidelines with different levels of cutoff. So the red dots are the non-smokers. So you can see there's not a single line that's a normal cutoff. So then again, it makes it harder for us as clinicians and harder for us as researchers to try and bring all of that together. So just um, a few slides really on the EDCO study. I'm around all of today and all of tomorrow. These results are in uh, peer review. It's a very long process due to COVID, but they're back in peer review. Um, so as, we, as Shirley said, we were sponsored um, by St. George's University uh, Hospitals and the funding was from the Carbon Monoxide Research Trust. The study team is great, includes um, toxicology um, experts, public health experts in the UK Health Security Agency, um, and most importantly, um, gas and industry experts. So the objective of the study was to ascertain the proportion of patients presenting to the emergency department with symptoms suggestive of CO exposure who had a raised COHB and a source identified. So really linking that diagnostic um, triad. So again, we know we have patients with headache, we know we have patients with raised COHB, but we don't necessarily know how many of them have actually had a CO um, exposure source that's kind of ongoing as opposed to a one-off event. So we did a multi-centre cohort study across um, four different hospitals. We recruited over 4,000 participants. Um, and what, the, what we did is we, the patients came into the emergency department, we identified them with um, as having chest pain of cardiac origin, headache, flu-like symptoms. We approached them um, to consent for the study. We took a venous gas sample, um, another sample um, for routine analysis, and we asked them a series of questions about their symptoms and also other information around um, carbon monoxide risk. So were other people in the home affected? Um, did it get better when they went outdoors? Did they have functioning carbon monoxide alarms? So we looked at case definitions. We defined patients as having suspected, probable, or confirmed exposure. 
and you'll see from the confirmed column to, be, to have a confirmed source of exposure, uh, a confirmed case of exposure rather, we had to have all three of those elements in place. So what we did for patients who we felt had a high suspicion um, of CO exposure or a raised COHB, we referred them using our usual public health guidance to the gas safety engineers and the gas, gas safety engineers visited the patient's um, home or source of exposure and took carbon monoxide readings and checked appliances. So what we were really aiming to do was say, actually, we think this patient's been exposed. How many of them have actually got a source of exposure in the home? So just in terms of the raised COHB, we, we found 26 cases. So bearing in mind this is off 4,000 patients, it goes back to my point around this is in the 25 million patients, a very small proportion of the emergency clinician work. Um, and what we found was we managed to, um, of the 26 cases with a raised COHB, there was n another 111 or so where there, was a, where there was a clear clinical suspicion that the patient had been referred. So either because the patient's... Um, had other people in the home who were, were affected, or in some cases where their carbon they'd come in because their carbon monoxide alar alarm had gone off. So we referred 137 cases um, to the gas safety engineers for an investigation of their home. Um, and within that, we found 21 probable cases of um, confirmed CO exposure, so from faulty gas appliances, for instance, and one confirmed case where there was an ongoing CO leak in the home. So that seems like quite small numbers, but I think in terms of um, the improving diagnosis, that patient with a confirmed case had a normal COHB in the emergency department. So it goes back to the, the thing we've talked about already, and will come up later around, COHB is not in isolation a good marker of um, CO exposure for ED clinicians to use. So going back to the other point, we also looked at whether the clinicians had documented CO exposure within the notes. So did the, uh, did the clinicians suspect exposure? Um, and you can see in the majority of cases where there was a confirmed COHB exposure, most of the clinicians didn't document that they thought that the patient's symptoms might be a result of carbon monoxide. And that's with a, with a raised COHB on a blood gas that was available to the clinicians. Um, so just... One sort of very quick um, word, really. I think we've what, one of the other things we looked at in the EDCO study before I run out of time um, is we asked patients about carbon monoxide utilisation. So did they have one? Did they test it? And we found about about 44 percent of the 4,000 patients we asked didn't have any carbon monoxide alarm in their home. So that's better than the um, the 12 percent that Sharon was talking about. But still, 44 percent of people didn't have a CO alarm. Um, so we use some, um, with the support of the CO Research Trust and follow-on um, funding to extend that component of the study, which is ongoing, so I haven't looked at the analysis, but we've, um, we'd, we're doing a sort of big survey of about five to 7,000 patients to look at what their carbon monoxide alarm use is, um, and we are um, pretty much just asking them very straightforward questions around, do they have an alarm, what type of alarm, what we're then linking that to things like housing type, socioeconomic status, status and ethnicity. So we hope to finish that data collection towards the end of the year. I'm just going to move on through those. Um, so you'll see just in terms of where we're up to, we're tracking well above, um, we've only been open for three months, it's a really straightforward um, survey and we would hope to use those results again to inform some of the policy um, think going forward and also what we've been doing as part of the study um, is offering patients CO safety advice, so where they're alerting us to not having um, a CO alarm, we're using it as an opportunity for them to be able to click on links to find out more about CO awareness. I think I'm at time, so I'm going to stop. Um, thanks very much. That's just a, I'm, as I said, I'm here. That's a really quick um, run through a 5,000 patient study, so I'm here for the next two days. Thanks, thanks. Anna. All my speakers have been pro um, told that they have to stick, stick to time. I know. Because I'm very good at doing this. So thank you. I think I might be under time, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so we've got time for one or two questions before I introduce my next speaker. Any questions for Heather? Rob. It's more than concrete. Is it 0.6%? Yeah. That's incredible. Yes, and at population level, it starts to become 
significant. We just can't prove that we can extrapolate it out to population level. But yeah, so of all attendances, 0.62 is quite a lot. And perhaps I can ask anyone asking questions, for my fault, to say who they are and where they're from. So that was Professor Rob Chilly from the <laughs> University of Hertfordshire, uh, and I work closely with Rob on another project on SEER. Um, any other questions for Heather? You're, yes, as a, as a microphone coming on as well. Um, Dr Jill Jackson from the Poison Service in the UK. That one confirmed case that you had, what was the criteria? Because it wasn't the carboxyhemoglobin. What were the criteria that, it, um, that that patient met for it, them to be referred to the... So there was two reasons, well, there's three reasons for referral arrays, COHB, and then, at, so if you look at the UK public health guidance, if there's high levels of clinician exposure, all clinicians have a public health uh, requirement that we refer to national gas safety engineers. So if you look at things like the Royal College Emergency Medicine guidance, so it was based on the screening questions that they had cohabitees um, with symptoms and that their exposure got better when they went outdoors. So there's an acronym called COMA that's not particularly well um, used, I would say, and we, there's other results that we published around how useful it is. So it wasn't the alarm, it didn't have the alarm. No, it was they came in with, so essentially they came in with a headache. We asked them the questions about did they have other people with headaches or other symptoms and did the symptoms get better outdoors? So the clinician alert was, I think this might be CO exposure, let's get your gas engineers round. And we should be doing that as clinicians. That's part of the national normal clinical guidance. We're just not very good at doing it, I think. Thank you. Um, we're going to take... Oh, Sharon. Um, <laughs> we know who you are. <laughs> There's a microphone coming on, just so people at the back can hear. You mentioned that um, breath analyzing does not correlate to... COHB or so we don't we the at the moment most UK emergency departments would use COHB because it's treated as the gold standard we don't use breath analyzers we didn't use breath analyzers for the study um, but in the scoping review that's in review um, there wasn't great correlation between breath analyzers and COHB but actually what those papers aren't necessarily showing is what those time frames were. So you need to do all of them at the same time to work out whether or not they correlate really. And quite often what happens is they'll get a CO breath analyzer in a first contact like fire service. But obviously when, when the blood gas analysis is done or the venous gas, it's, you're much further down the line. So there is some data on it, but we didn't look at it specifically for this. Thank you, Heather. I think we're gonna stop now and introduce our next speaker, but thank you. Thanks. Heather. So there will be an opportunity at the end for some more questions and answers for all three speakers. So continuing on this session on improving diagnosis, a pleasure to introduce Professor Chris Morris, University of Newcastle. Uh, Chris is going to talk about the limitations of carb carboxyhemoglobin and the cr uh, critical search for a new biomarker. And it's all around how we look at um, CO poisoning and the biomarkers that are available and could become available in the future. So a short intro to Chris. Chris, University of Newcastle um, from the Translational and Clinical Research Institute. Uh, Chris is a senior lecturer there. He teaches for disorders of the nervous system for final year undergraduate biomedical science students. Chris has two areas of research at Newcastle. His work in the neurodegenerative disorders, such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, and also in neurotoxicology, in identifying how different poisons might affect the nervous system. And I think, Chris, that's where we have worked together in the past. As science director of the Newcastle Brain Tissue Resource, which is one of the UK's leading tissue banks for neurodegenerative disorders, Chris also studies disorders such as dementia with uh, Lewy bodies, and his research is aimed at identifying the biology involved, the clinical symptoms, and potential ta uh, treatment targets. Chris has for many years been a member of the British Tox Society, sat for years, uh, 10 years as a member of the UK Government Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, he's been on the Expert Committee on Pesticides, which was formerly a Government UK gov uh, Committee on Pesticides. And since 2013, Chris has been external chair of the Parkinson's UK and Multiple Sclerosis Society Brain Banks peer review panel. 
and is a member of the Parkinson UK College of Experts. So it's a great pleasure, Chris, to welcome you today and to present your findings. Thank you. So hopefully I get this to work. Ah, me next. So thanks to Adrian and Kimberly and the team for making this such an easy travel down here today uh, and for Shirley for keeping the bad bits out of my biog. Um, so we'll carry on with what we're interested in here. Um, I think Heather put it quite clearly about what we're looking for here. We've got a very nice biomarker for carbon monoxide exposure. That's carboxyhemoglobin. It's been around for many, many years. It's very specific for carbon monoxide. We can detect it very easily, but it has its limitations. Obviously, the signs and symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning are very vague. It's a headache, it's fatigue, you're not feeling particularly well, and it often happens at times of the year, in the winter time when we're seeing colds and flus appearing. It can happen in the summer as well, when we can get all of those other things. We've been out socializing at the barbecue. All of those things are happening. We're getting those symptoms. But nobody's putting two and two together, particularly in an emergency situation where you would want to use carboxyhemoglobin to check on somebody. And then we've got those guidelines, those vague ideas of, well, when is a toxic exposure to carbon monoxide? What is that level? We know from looking at anybody in this room will have a carboxyhemoglobin level in their blood of perhaps one or two percent. And that's because we produce it internally. We produce our own carboxyhemoglobin inside our bodies. But as the cars go past, we pull in all of that carboxy, carbon monoxide and we build up a carbon carboxyhemoglobin level in our blood. So we've got that to worry about. And then we've got the hopefully rarer beast now of the smoker who complicates things where we see a raised carboxyhemoglobin level in their blood and then when the clinician has somebody who might have a suspicion of carbon monoxide exposure we turn around and say oh well but there are smokers who have very high levels it could be simply that so we don't start to look at things and then we've got carboxy hemoglobin itself and carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide, that perfect po poison. You can't smell it, you can't taste it, you can't see it. It's a nice hit and run poison. If you take somebody away from exposure, the carboxyhemoglobin starts to drop. And this is the kind of thought process I always kind of think of, is that if you've got somebody in an emergency situation, they're picked up by those first responders they're unconscious, they're not breathing very well. They go on to oxygen, they're helped. By the time they get to accident and emergency, by the time the clinician thinks, ooh, this could be, they're asking those questions that Heather put to them, then the carboxyhemoglobin is down in that pesky smoker's level and you're not thinking, putting two and two together and thinking this is carbon monoxide poisoning. So we need something to, oops, I've gone a bit too far, have I? No. Nope. We need something to help carboxyhemoglobin to make sure that we've got a good marker. Because it does go down so quickly, we need something else. We need something specific for carbon monoxide. Again, can it detect those low levels of exposure that we think we're constantly exposed to in homes? If we think about the figures, if we've got 100,000 people exposed who are turning up an accident and emergency, what's about the rest of us? It needs to be robust and long-lived if we want a marker. Something that's still there, still putting that fingerprint at the scene of the crime when the carboxyhemoglobin has disappeared. And can it tell us how much exposure has taken place? If it was 20% at one time, will it still be there a few hours later? So that's what we're looking for. We're relying slightly on the fact that carbon monoxide can be a good guy. We produce it all the time. So we've got a little enzyme in our bodies, heme oxygenase. 
it breaks down the pigments, the heme pigments in blood cells and in other tissues. And as part of that, it produces carbon dioxide, tiny, tiny levels. Those tiny levels actually help cells. They help cells off fight off injury, fight off decay, fight off infections. So carbon monoxide is useful. But when it comes to high levels, does it leave that little fingerprint that says, ooh, there's something that's going on in those cells that's started to alter and has it changed them in a certain way? So that's what we've been doing. We've been trying to harness what carbon monoxide does normally to try and find a marker that will help carboxyhemoglobin. So we've taken white blood cells from volunteers and we've exposed them to a certain amount of carbon monoxide. A bit like you'd get from perhaps a faulty gas boiler in the, you shouldn't blame faulty gas boilers all the time, but something that is akin to what you might have on a, a wintry evening. You come home, the boiler's been going, the carbon monoxide level has started to raise and then it goes off. So about six hours, we've taken these white cells. We haven't killed the cells. We know carbon monoxide will shut things down. So this is a relatively, relatively low level just to see what changes happen in these white blood cells that we can easily access in a blood sample. And then we've used this fancy technique, RNA sequencing, to see what happens. And we see typical things that happen in cells when they're bombarded with carbon monoxide. So the big red splodge in the middle and the green splodge, they're the mitochondria, the batteries of the cells. These are the cells, the parts of the cells that produce energy, that keeps the cell going. And we know carbon monoxide will home in on those parts of the cell. So it's leaving the carbon monoxide we've exposed these cells to is leaving those little traces on the cell. Again, splodge. This change here is telling us that yes, it's actually those energy production things that carbon monoxide hits that starts to get changed, this signaling pathway. So again, it's leading that little trace of where it's been. And the same here. And this is quite interesting in that this is how blood cells interact with blood vessels. So it might relate to how people get headache as one of those symptoms that you get with carbon monoxide poisoning. So it's hitting again that particular system. And we get lots of things to look at. And this is kind of our hit list of what we can do. So we now need to go a little bit further. We've got these things that we think have changed, that little fingerprint. We need to try and see if we can take that a bit further. How sensitive are they to low levels of carbon monoxide? How long do they last? Can we be using those in a real life situation? So we've tried to do that. So we've got information from a patient study. So this is again, carbon monoxide at low levels, pretty good, can help. So this is a group of patients who have a lung disorder which stops them breathing. The lungs stiffen up a little bit. And the idea here was a treatment that would help with the breathing, that would open the lungs up, allow them to breathe a little bit more. So for two weeks, they were given, or rather one week, they were given a small dose twice a week of carbon monoxide. Then they increased it slightly for 12 weeks one two-hour exposure twice a week and then they were followed up so we've taken their blood samples it's kind of a real life exposure we've taken that and we've compared the placebo group with the treatment group to see our placebo group here is effectively somebody the average person on the street somebody else the treatment group is our carbon monoxide exposure and we've tried to see if we can see similar changes Again, lots of nice things in our lists. We're seeing something similar to what we found in the lab. So this is longer term exposure. This little change, this map kinase signaling pathway is what we picked up in the lab. So similar things are happening. 
in those cells, in this little group of patients who've been exposed deliberately to lower levels of carbon monoxide. Same thing again, it's happening there, and particularly one certain enzyme which seems to be going astray, which seems to be hit by carbon monoxide. And again, this nitric oxide signaling pathway, that's the thing that causes the headache, we think, that you get typically associated with carbon monoxide. So the things we see in the lab are the things we're seeing in the patients. It's almost real world, it's nice and controlled, it's not got the emergency department situation where you might see differences patient to patient, so it's almost real world exposure. We're not getting very high levels of, thankfully perhaps, carbon monoxide exposure here. We're only getting about a maximum of 5% carboxyhemoglobin. So this is not outside the, let's say, the normal ranges that we'd ec expect. It's only about 2% 2 2 average carboxyhemoglobin that these people were exposed to. So we're still seeing that signal. Whereas our exposure was quite acute, this is a kind of a chronic exposure. 12 weeks on and off, a bit like perhaps you'd have in a home. You go back to your home, you're exposed, you leave again. Or you're out in the traffic, you're exposed, you leave again. So it's early days. So we're hoping to get that. We're now heading for the second part of this, taking again those volunteer lymphocytes, homing in on that little fingerprint, see if we can get a little bit closer to a marker that will help with carboxyhemoglobin so we can get a much more accurate idea of who's being exposed to carbon monoxide. So just in summary, we need those additional markers to help with carboxyhemoglobin. We think we've got a good signature set. We hope to take that further forward. We've got some overlaps with those chronically treated individuals, so there's some idea that things are working. But I think we've got to do a little bit more work before we can actually put our finger on what the real markers might do to help. So just the thanks. I'm usually the person who just sits back and takes all the plaudits. The real people who do the work. Certainly to Izzy who got us down this road and helped us with this and all the help that Izzy gives us uh, and our people who over in uh, the States who are helping with the patient-based study. So, thanks. Thanks, Chris. And I think we've got time for a couple of questions, if that's all right. Okay. Any questions? I'll just bring your microphone down. Thanks, Kimberly. Oh dear, I don't like speaking in these. Uh, that was really, really interesting. Thank you so much. I was just wondering, so about five percent COHB. Are there any plans of trying for even lower levels? Because five percent is obviously a little bit higher than what we'd see just based on breathing in from the road, that sort of thing. Are you planning on seeing if it works for even lower levels? We certainly are. I think the patient-based studies, they're trying for more because their average was about two percent, five percent maximum they could see glimmers of things going on in terms of what their primary endpoints were. They're thinking of going more. And one of the slides I showed was from back in the 70s where they tried 1,000 parts per million exposure. <laughs> we'll see. It's one of those things where having the right samples with the right exposures will tell us whether we're on the right path. Thank you. Any other questions? Chris, perhaps I can ask, this, you're looking at adults here. Yeah. Is there any opportunity of looking at younger age groups? And are there any, going to be any changes in the, the cellular aspects of this, and particularly around development and long-term exposure, for example, in adolescents? We, we haven't got any plans specifically to look at those. I think we, if we get a, a marker that picks out adults in general, then we can see whether it will be applicable to specific age groups. Certainly younger individuals would be the case. We know from some of the sad studies of the past that 
children are probably slightly more vulnerable than adults. Certainly some older adults are, are more vulnerable than the general population, but certainly children might be more vulnerable, so we'd want to have a look at those as part of ongoing studies. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm just going to bring the microphone. Two questions. Uh, one is, um, you mentioned RNA changes in the white blood cells. Can you um, be a little more specific, and how expensive would that test be? The second question is, um, anecdotally, we've seen that carbon monoxide poisoning survivors have elevated white blood cell count. Can you um, tell us if you've seen that in your research, and what that, you know, what may have change that, cause that? So the RNA changes that we see are basically all of the cells will produce, we have DNA, which produces RNA, which then produces an eventual protein. What we see acutely are these changes in RNA. So it's how the cell responds normally to carbon monoxide. And so we're seeing a list of different changes there. How expensive? Depends on how many we do, but typically something in the order of 200 pounds would be a baseline test. Technologies are getting better and better at doing almost bedside analysis of these things now. I should imagine in five, ten years' time that would be about the ballpark figure that you'd be looking at for one of these types of tests. Do we see white cell changes? We've not looked at proliferation in here uh, or anything specific. But we do see some changes in there that might indicate that you would get proliferation because of that. You could see a physiological response that in if you're reducing oxygen levels, the natural response of a body would be to increase white, uh, red cell counts, but also white cell counts as well. So our last speaker today on this session on improving diagnosis, pleasure to welcome to the podium Sean England. Sean is, unfortunately, has all his supervisors here today, all four of us. <laughs> so Mari, Rob, Izzy and myself. So he's um, really up against it today. Um, but we're really pleased to be able to um, ask Sean to present on some research that he's doing, funded again, obviously, by the court. So um, Sean, student, completing his PhD, uh, the start of a journey for, for Sean. Um, he's in the field of toxicology. He is registered at the University of Hertfordshire. Um, and his project is entitled Evaluating the Use of a Novel Pupillometer as a Sensitive Indicator of Low-Level Carbon Monoxide Exposure. And I think this is quite an interesting project. I would say that. I'm one of the supervisors. But I think it is an interesting way of looking at something that is really non-invasive and a potential of looking at um, exposure to carbon monoxide and low-level um, Sean himself has a background in medical science, obtaining a bachelor's and a master's degree in medical sciences and neuroimaging, respectively, at Bangor University in Wales. So welcome, Sean. Over to you. Thank you, Shirley, and thank you, Adrian, for inviting me to speak. So before I start, I just want to apologise for my accent. I've managed to get rid of it yet, so if anyone who s struggles to understand what I'm saying, you can always ask me questions afterwards. So like I said, I'm going to talk about the possibilities of using pupillometry as a novel bi biomarker. So some of you might be wondering what exactly is pupillometry. Pupillometry is the measurement of pupil diameter and reactivity in response to a stimulus. And you can use different stimuli to trigger different pupillary responses, such as use, triggering the pupillary light reflex with light, the uh, near pupil near response with near fixation, or the psychosensory pupil response through cognitive activity, which is currently quite a popular one in pu people interested in pupillometry. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to focus on using light as a stimulus. 
Now, when you use light as a stimulus, you have two main forms of pupillometry, the first of which is dynamic pupillometry. So this involves recording and, and quantifying the dynamics of the pupil of the light response through the use of infrared videography. This allows you to record the PLR over a light and dark cycle, since the wavelength of infrared light falls outside the range of normal visual spectrum. The second of which is chromatic pupillometry, in which you use different wavelengths of light to preferentially stimulate different neuro of different photoreceptors in the eye. So this is a pupillogram. This is what you produce when you do pupillometry. What you see here is you start off with a period of dark accommodation, which allows you to obtain the baseline pupil diameter. There's natural fluctuations in the baseline diameter that correlate with cognitive activity. So when you switch on the light, there is a small delay before the pupil begins to constrict. This is what we call the response latency. It's a useful parameter to extract. So when, after this, the pupil begins to constrict until it reaches the minimum pupil diameter. You can also extract the time to fully constrict as well, which is a useful parameter to look at. When the pupil begins to constrict, you initially have a rapid constriction before it slows down to reach the, uh, to reach the minimum pupil diameter, in which you can calculate the maximum constriction velocity. You can also calculate the difference between the baseline pupil diameter and the minimum pupil diameter to pull out the absolute constriction amplitude. Once the MPD has been reached and the light remains on, the pupil enters a period known as escape in which it slowly begins to redilate. And this is due to the rod and cone photoreceptors desensitizing quickly, but the constriction is maintained by the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. Once the light is then switched off, the pupil begins to rapidly dilate and you can calculate the absolute dilation velocity. Now, to understand the possibility of pupillometry as a biomarker, you kind of need to understand a bit about the neurophysiology of the PLR. So I'm going to start off with a constriction pathway. When light enters the eye, it interacts with the photoreceptors in the outer layers of the retina. A signal is then sent down the optic nerve towards the optic chiasm, in which the nasal retinal fibers will cross over to the opposite side of the optic tract, and the temporal retinal fibers remain on the same path while well, some single signals then travel towards the lateral geniculate nucleus, others pass through the pretectal olivarian nucleus in the dorsal midbrain, and then are projected towards the odinga westphal nucleus. From here, parasympathetic preganglionic uh, fibers then transport the signal along the ocular motor nerve, which synapses with the ciliary ganglion. Finally, the postganglionic short ciliary nerves then uh, pass the signal towards the iris sphincter muscle, which it innervates, causes a release of acetylcholine, and ultimately pupil constriction. Now, on the other side of this, the dilation pathway, it uh, originates in the hypothalamus. So what you see, so in the absence of light, you have um, alpha-2 adrenergic activation that inhibits the odinga westphal nucleus, leading to suppression of the uh, parasympathetic innervation of the iris sphincter muscle, leading to reduction in acetylcholine. As well as this, you have activation of the sympathetic pathway, which follows a three neuron arc along the central and peripheral nervous system. Again, starting at the hypothalamus, travels down through the midbrain towards the uh, preglanglionic neuron at the ciliospinal center of Budge. From here, it then ascends the spinal cord from T1 to C8, synapsing with the superior severical ganglion. Finally, tra transporting along the long ciliary nerves to the iris dilator muscle, releasing noradrenaline at the neuromuscular junction and causing pupil dilation. To just summarize these two pathways briefly, you've got constriction or meiosis, which the iris sphincter muscle contracts and the iris dilator, iris dilator muscle relaxes. This is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system and the main neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. 
On the other side, you've got the iris dilator muscle contracting and the iris sphincter muscle relaxing. This is controlled by the sympathetic nervous system and there's a release of noradrenaline. So from this information, we know that if there's anything that affects the balance of these neurotransmitters, it will likely be reflected in pupillary light reflex, or it will be, as evident in other examples. So if we think about some of the known effects of carbon monoxide, we know very simply that it binds the hemoglobin. So we know it can re reduce the oxygen carrying capacity of it. We also know that there are some evidence of changes in visual function, namely subtle changes that are evident in or similar to what's seen in optic neuropathies. And coincidentally, chromatic pupillometry has been used as well to look at optic neuropathies and assess the uh, photo, uh, photoreceptor health in those conditions, people with those conditions. We also know that they cause central nervous system dysfunction. From this, we, can, we, we don't know the exact mechanism. So there are different ways, whether it's the, uh, the fact that it's bind to hemoglobin and the central nervous system has fixed oxygen needs and this isn't being met, or whether the fact that the endogenous CO that, um, helps modulate a synaptic transmission is being affected by the introduction of exogenous CO. But we do know that even from the 1920s, there's been reports of disturbances to the normal pupillary reactions. And we also know that there's some cases of this dysfunction to acetylcholinergic neurons. So we know in some capacity, CO has the capability to affect this uh, balance between the neurotransmitters. Now, some of the other toxicological examples that have pupillometry been used are all examples when this balance of neurotransmitters has been affected. So my first example is organophosphates. Uh, if you don't know what an organophosphate is, it's a class of compounds typically seen in nerve agents or insecticides. Its mode of action is usually to inhibit the acetylcholine esterase, which leads to an accumulation of acetylcholine, so would result in pupil constriction, which is where you typically see the pinpoint pupils. On the other side of this, you've got botulinum toxin. People will know us as, as Botox injections. So what this does is inhibits the release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction, really causing pupil dilation. Now it's usually taken in by the parasympathetic uh, fibers of the uh, ciliary ganglion or the neuromuscular junction of the iris sphincter muscle, which is why you see that pupillary dilation. Another example is the People have looked in the case studies at the night, some members of the nightshade family, namely Devil's Snare and Angel's Trumpet. Now, this has led for direct contact of the ocular tissue and has led, again, to pupil dilation. Another example, finally, is someone has looked at using pupillometry in terms of mercury intoxication, in which case you didn't see an exact change in the baseline pupil diameter, but you did see a change in the affected uh, pupillary light response. So they saw a slower pupillary recovery following expo in patients that had mercury intoxication. Now, all these examples, there was also a, uh, or the ones before the mercury intoxication, there was an effect to the pupillary light reflex as well, whether that be a reduced response that they were gaining or just not a response at all. So to summarize this thing, so pupillometry offers an insight into the nervous system health, namely the uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic arms of the autonomic nervous system. We also know that disruptions to the acetylcholine are not adrenaline balance can affect the pupillary light response. And we know that carbon monoxide intoxication is capable of impairing the central nervous system function. So the four, we have the central nervous system disruption is likely to be reflected in the pupillary light reflex of a patient exposed to CO. So that means that we know that pupillometry is a strong candidate as a new biomarker to help with improve diagnostic methods for detecting patients exposed to carbon monoxide. So I'll just briefly mention what the work I'm doing is in my PhD project. So we tried coming up with a catchy name for it, which we've come up with PICO. This stands for the Pupillary Evaluation of Exposure to Carbon Monoxide. You can imagine that the M is actually an O, because CO, after all. 
So what this is involving is evaluating the use of a novel pupilometer as a sensitive indicator of low-level carbon monoxide exposure. So this novel pupilometer is what we've called chromodynamic pupilometry. What it does is it combines the features of dynamic and chromatic pupilometry to assess the dynamic nature of the pupillary light reflex, but also evaluating the different photoreceptors' contributions to that reflex. So this work is funded by the SEO Research Trust, and you can see me here modeling the device that we're currently using. So what it is, is it is a standard VR headset that is retrofitted with infrared cameras and infrared LED lights. So it allows us to have a dark uh, condition, or scotopic light conditions, so we can record the pupil's reaction across different light cycles, and the screen will project light in, in flashes of different durations, and that allows us to quantify the, the pupillary light reflex across time. So the current work that we're doing is related to the reproducibility and the optimization of the stimuli that we use in the pupillometer. Can we establish this as a, a useful tool that actually works as a pupillometer since it is a new form of it that we're using that deviates slightly from the current methods that a lot of researchers use? And then this will lead us on to then investigate the dose response to carbon monoxide and then beyond that look at the age-related effects that we can see if we see response to carbon monoxide in people's pupilograms, and we can create a prolific response arc. So these are the references that I've referred to during the presentation, and thank you. Thank you, Sean. That's really interesting, but then I would say that one. <laughs> um, so I've got a couple of questions. So can we go, Kimberly? Thank you, the gentleman. Hello, th thanks for that talk. It's really interesting. Um, you talk about age-related stuff related to this project. Just thinking about older patients and their pharmacology generally and anticholinergic medicines that they may be taking, the anticholinergic burden, that sort of thing. Would you be looking to sort of titrate this, correlate this in the context of medicines that they take? Because that will clearly affect or potentially affect their pupillary response out yep. with CO. Yeah, so we, uh, when we're doing this research, we are looking at the, uh, the drugs they are maybe on, the, what they're prescribed to as well. We're taking into consideration their age, any conditions that might affect the pupillary light reflex. So we are looking to map out uh, how it might differ with different conditions and different how people are taking different things as well. So it's not just purely uh, healthy people that we're looking at. We're looking at all ages currently. Even for these, uh, when we're optimizing the stimuli, we're taking into consideration the, the drugs that might be on or any conditions they're facing at the currently. And there was a question next to you. Hi, thanks very much. Uh, Laura Fatah from Policy Connect. I really enjoyed that, thank you. It was very interesting indeed. I guess just um, thinking about moving it forward, do you have an idea of kind of how expensive this kind of diagnostic method would be or how, what facility, how, how available the facilities are? Or I guess maybe that's, that might be a, a fair question for the future. So uh, the kind of end goal with this research is to try and make it affordable, make it into kind of combine it. A lot of people are looking into using pupillometry on a mobile device as an app, per se. So we're hoping to aim in that direction and create a more affordable, uh, easy method to apply in uh, kind of doctor's surgeries and such. Any other questions? Well, let's, we'll open it up for all three speakers, but for now, let's thank Sean. So I think this session has opened up an opportunity, and as each of our speakers has said, uh, Sean, Chris, and Heather, that they are here uh, during the next two days to uh, have a chat and discuss this, and hopefully some ideas will come out through the research um, tomorrow. I think what this session has opened up, and it, it picks up on Sharon's uh, work earlier, um, is obviously education and training, I think we do still need to be clear on our education of exposure to CO and certainly helping with the training side of things. 
The biomarkers are important. We have got biomarkers, but we do need to look at more biomarkers that can perhaps pinpoint particularly low-level chronic exposure. And for me as a toxicologist, as Chris will say, defining between acute and chronic high and low doses is very, very important. I think we do need to understand the symptoms. And again, it's that education and training and being aware of how we can as associate those symptoms with our first thoughts on perhaps looking at CO um, exposure. I think looking and listening to all the talks today, there is links between the work that um, Sean is doing. And I have to say, Sean has only been working on this about 15 months. So quite a lot of work already. And the questions around age adjustments and disease adjustments are things that have been discussed and they are very important. But taking that with the work that Chris has also undertaken with the biomarker he's also looking at, there could be links and looking back at that data and just seeing how we can associate the changes in the uh, pupil size, etc. So I think to today's session, I hope, has opened up a lot of ideas and thoughts and where we are. It's, it's the beginning of a journey looking at new biomarkers. There is a lot more, certainly from the work that Heather has done. A great deal of work is still under, being undertaken and looking at biomarkers from the samples that have been taken by colleagues at the um, UK HSA, that's the two TIMS that um, Heather showed on her um, slide. So before we break for coffee, and coffee, we'll, we'll have coffee at 11.40 uh, for half an hour to 12.10. Are there any other questions for our colleagues here today? Anything else? Well, oh. Thanks very much. Um, another one from me, Laura Fattar again. Just um, thinking around COMA, that acronym that was mentioned in terms of the EDCO study, that's something which um, has been around for a while, and I just wondered if the panellists had any idea of how we can promote the use of COMA, um, or if there are any, any work going on in that area, that might be really interesting to hear about. I'm guessing I press this button, can you hear? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the challenge with coma is that it's in lots of guidance. So it's in the so from an emergency clinician perspective, it's already in the Royal College of Emergency Medicine guidance about what we should be doing. But what as a clinician, what you don't do goes back to Shay's point about education. You go to the guidance when you suspect someone's got carbon monoxide exposure. So we go round in circles, and you know we're I work now in a very EDCO or a very carbon monoxide aware department with two clinicians sitting behind you who know about carbon monoxide because we talk about it all the time. Um, and there's, but that isn't common. I mean, we've been going around emergency medicine conferences, emergency nursing conferences, talking about it. But I think the other thing that we need to do is that in the search for evidence, coma's not well validated. So we don't really know whether it makes any difference or not. And some of the data we've got from our studies, it doesn't really make any difference. That actually clini clinician suspicion is probably better possibly we didn't really look at it but i would say i would say me being conscious or being aware that the that a clinician might be exposed is probably better than coma but I, but we don't know that because the evidence behind whether coma works or not isn't there that's a study right there isn't it but um we'll see is he thank you um isabella myers and um i mine's a sort of broader question in terms of the work that Chris and Sean are undertaking, how would, if, if they were successful, if they both were successful, what's the pathway to actually getting that into the clinician's um, perceptual field? And actually, you know, is it always through the guidance? But then, as you say, the, the guidance is only looked at once the suspicion is made. So where, how do we fill that gap? between what could be a revolutionary new, two new biomarkers and clinical practice and awareness. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Don't know if these work. Oh, they do work. Um, there's a fairly well-worn pathway for taking a diagnostic from the lab to clinical use. It's usually done through NIHR. You would 
need to look at the care pathway in terms of how that diagnostic would fit in. It would have to have high sensitivity and specificity. Uh, there would be the usual cost-benefit analysis as well. I think the fact that you're seeing 0.6% of A&E admissions having some form of carbon monoxide exposure isn't what we've been told by our colleagues necessarily in A&E when they tell us we don't really see carbon monoxide exposure. So there's clearly a, a large population being exposed to carbon monoxide, so there may be benefits to bringing it in. But there's certainly a, a well-worn pathway of how you introduce something to clinical use. And, and I think your question is, is all around how we influence policy. And I think today it is looking, and tomorrow we'll be looking at research and understanding how we can monitor, assess, and evaluate the research that we're doing to look at new biomarkers, new ways of being able to understand and assess low-level chronic exposure to CO. But I think at the end of the day, what we have to do is work together. And I think we often work, when, like all research, in silos. And it's, it's conferences like this and opportunities that evolve all of us to come together to see where those links are. And it's like a map. And it's linking those maps. And the end point is always down to how we influence policy. And yes, behind all this is how much is it going to cost? And where's that money coming from? But, you know, we have to park that and actually look at where we are today. Uh, we've got some fantastic funding from the court, but I think we've got there's more to be done and how we influence that going forward is very, very important. So are there any other questions? Oh, at the back, thank you. Hi, sorry, I'm Rachel Harrison. I'm a midwife from um, UHGW. It was just to check because we use a screening test of um, carbon monoxide, a breath test, and I just want to see what the reliability of that was compared to your biomarkers, or is that kind of built into studies? Because obviously this is quite a good basic screening tool for us, and obviously we, you know, it is something we use. I appreciate obviously it's only the expired carbon monoxide, but just as to how that correlates. Well, we, we unfortunately haven't had a look at breath expiration of carbon monoxide and how it links to our markers. I think what we have to be aware of is that you just need to, you, you, there's obviously uh, monitors out there and they are giving us something to work with. What we're looking at is how can we work with that information and how we can improve on looking at other biomarkers. But you know, it's like everything, isn't it? The data's there. We shouldn't ignore any data that's coming forward. But again, it's making sure we're working together and using what information and tests that are currently there and perhaps improving on those tests or improving on new biomarkers that, are, what, that can be used. And Sean, you had a comment. I was just going to say, we're, we're in the same boat as in we haven't really looked into the differences yet. However, we're hoping with use of the pupillometry that it will kind of transcend this uh, time limiting option that you kind of see with breath analyzers and uh, carboxyhemoglobin levels so we can hope hopefully it'll be it'll be a separate from that kind of aspect and and i think what's important is that you know you have a baseline you know what that's telling you and we shouldn't uh, again cause any panic i think what we have currently you know tests and looking at carboxyhemoglobin are all very important what we're doing now is taking what we're um, looking in the research and seeing what we can do to improve those diagnoses and working with our current um, tools, but improving on those tools or working concurrently with those tools and bringing that all together. So I, I don't think it's to say what the breath test isn't suitable or isn't telling us something. We should still be doing that. But what today should be doing is bringing together improving diagnosis. The next session, which Izzy is going to chair, is the treatment and therapeutics and then later this afternoon, we've got the understanding of comorbidities and C exposure chaired by Rob. So I think it's, it's a matter of discussions, talking about it, what can we do, what's out there, and how can we improve this? So unless there's any other questions, can I thank our three speakers again?
I think it's uh, food for thought. I'm hoping that you'll all have a chance to network over coffee, and coffee is about to be served.